Welcome to Revelations TV special program on the greatest book in the world. 22 contributors uh, wrote in this book why they wanted the Bible and their favorite verse. And we are very privileged to have three of them here today. And we are going to share together and talk together and find out all about them and why they were involved with this book. First, Jonathan, Jonathan Aitken, thank you for joining us today. Jonathan is a former cabinet minister and member of parliament who spent seven years in prison after being convicted of perjury. He's an author, broadcaster and currently president of Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Mandy, thank you too for coming to us today. Mandy, Mandy Smith was brought up a Roman Catholic, married Rolling Stone Bill Wyman when she was just 18. She became one of the world's top models and has also enjoyed a successful singing career. And Linvoy, uh, the handsomest one of the lot. <laughs> Linvoy, Linvoy Primus, began his professional career at Charlton Athletic but in his time at Portsmouth that he is usually remembered. Uh, in 2002, with Darren Moore, he launched Faith and Football, which aims to support a number of community programs. First, what we're going to do is to ask each one, why did they contribute to the book and why did they put their particular favourite verse in? Jonathan, maybe we can begin with you, please. Well, the King James Bible lives in most people's memory because it's been read for centuries in our churches. And with me, I've always loved the beautiful cadences of this particular version of the Bible. But while I was in prison, one verse particularly struck me, and I sort of stumbled across it almost by chance. But the verse was the opening verse of Psalm 130. And the verse goes... Out of the depths have I cried to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. And it's a beautiful prayer, really. Um, a prayer which, of course, was written 3,000 years ago. And a prayer which has appealed to readers of the Bible all down the centuries. And we know it's a great many people's favorite psalm and favorite opening verse. Uh, and among the great men of history who loved it uh, were Luther... Uh, Bunyan, Augustine, and sort of more recently Oscar Wilde used this verse when he was in prison and his own book of prison memoirs is called De Profundis, which is Latin for out of the depths. And so it, perhaps it speaks to almost anybody in trouble, but certainly when I was in trouble <laughs> I, I used it and loved it. Great, thank you. Mandy, what was yours and why did you want to get involved in this project? Um, well, it's actually James Hastings who you know, put the book together. Um, James interviewed me for, for something else and then he told me about this book. He told me about this book a long time ago and I never thought it was going to happen. And he kept saying, yeah, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And um, so at first I never really got the gist of it, what, you know, how it was going to be compiled and what it was going to be about. And, um, and he said to me, just... He kept saying yeah, every time we'd, we'd send emails, just find your favourite verse in the Bible. And I said, OK. So it did take me a while. And, um, and then the one for me was Luke 15, verse 20. Um, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Mm -hmm. I suppose for me, I mean, there's so many great verses, but that one for me was about... I mean, I've, as you said, I was brought up Roman Catholic, so it's always been with me. But then I fell away. Um, God was always there, but it was me that, that moved away. But he is always there, no matter what you do, your failings, or if you feel that you've done too much and you can't go back. He's always mm. there, open-armed and, mm. and compassionate. Amen. I, I, and I think we're going to see, because with both of you, those verses had particular yeah. significance of where you were and yeah. I want to go into a little bit of your okay. stories in a minute as well but but Linvoy what, what was your verse and what made you say I want to get involved in this project yeah I think um, you know the initial contact I received an email um, through the charity uh, just saying about this and and I, I think the year before a few months before um, 
I'd been uh, to London to the Houses of Parliament to speak uh, to the MPs about um, you know what's happened since football in terms of uh, my faith and faith in football um, and so that was a nice experience but um, when I thought well there's an opportunity to you know have my story in another and another book that can go into anyone's hands and how many different people how many different walks of life are involved I thought you know that's great because um, you know we know faith you know appeals to every every person and uh, you know whether it's a young person or old person there's an opportunity for a story to go out that will you know get somebody's attention um, my favorite uh, scripture was uh, Jeremiah 29 11 and it just talks about God's plan you know for my life and yes. and you know when I think that at the point when I read that you know I was worried about so many different things and when I realized that God had a plan for my life you know a plan to prosper me not to harm me I thought to myself wow that's the first time I've ever had a reassurance that you know my future is taken care of and uh, and that's what you know my life has hung on that God's got a plan that's going to you know take me wherever he wants to take me but mm. you know not to harm me mm. I mean one of the things which is very interesting for all of you I mean the verse does mean a, something specific to you but we have to take in the word of God and, and it, it can't just be there in the Bible and, and we, we need to be able to receive it. Is, is that something you constantly do, Jonathan, these days, continue to receive God's word and allow it to speak into your life? Yes, I think as a result of uh, really going into the depths and finding certain things in the depths, I have become uh, a quite a disciplined Bible reader. And I do read the Bible every morning and find new things in new passages. And uh, both the verses uh, that Mandy and Linroy have chosen have spoken to me as well. But if I can just tell a story about Mandy's verse, which is so wonderful. It's the verse from the story of the prodigal son. And while I was in prison, there was one evening in the chapel... Uh, something called the inmates' evening, which was on the whole deeply embarrassing. With people <laughs> reading out verses about uh, roses red, violet, blue, dear Lord Jesus, we love you. I mean, very praiseworthy, but not sort of very inspiring. However, uh, towards the end of the inmates' evening, there were four guys, and they'd sort of got a theatrical producer as a prisoner who put on a little play of the prodigal son. Mm. And th this was the prodigal son done but in kind of prison lingo. And there was, and the father was played rather like Marlon Brando playing the godfather, <laughs> and the son was a kind of wild young hoodlum. And finally you get to the point which is uh, where the son is coming back. And in this play, um, the father was always looking out for his son. He was getting out his binoculars every day, hoping he was going to come back. And suddenly he sees the son a long way off. And then there was a wonderful moment in this play, which isn't exactly in the Bible, but the, when he shouts to his wife, God has a wife in this version, he says, Doris, where's me running shoes? And she said, what running shoes? He said, the running shoes I ran the London Marathon in. She said, you ran the London Marathon 22 years ago. Anyway, they find in the attic these running shoes, and he ties them on, and then he runs out Brilliant. to get... Brilliant. And, of course, that is almost the key word in that. Yeah. He ran to him, and, of course, uh, you know... As we all probably experience, God does run out yeah. to those He is forgiving, yeah. His prodigal mm. sons and daughters. So it's a yeah. wonderful yeah. memory. Mm. But, but that's brilliant because it, it, it makes it real, doesn't it? And, mm. and sometimes you, you need to see something like that yeah. just, just, just yes. to take on board. Mandy, how, how do you, I mean, you still live a very busy life. Yeah. I, I mean, how, how do you, or where do you find the time to just take on Scripture? What, what works for you, if I can put it um, like that? My relationship with God is, is constant, and I've built that up over years. So it's not I just go on a Sunday mm. to see him and, you know, say thank you or just read. Mm. And, and for me, I'll be really, really honest, because I think a lot of people think if you find God that you become this avid reader of the Bible, and for me, that wasn't so. Um, and I think God opens your eyes at certain times for certain things, mm. and mine's happening now of more reading of the Bible. I think mine before was about just um, the process of meeting God and building that relationship and just sharing um, the word or, 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 you know, my story. Whereas now, mine, the next part, I feel, is learning a lot more 
about the word and the reading. Mm -hmm. um, hence, I was sort of saying earlier about trying to find... I, hope, I wish there was more places where you could do Bible reading, you know, in classes with people, but just, you know, a little bit sort of more up-to-date stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where I'm at at the minute. Great, great. Linvoy, where are you at? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I used to, going back you know, for well, many years now, um, you know, I used to go to church, you know, forced to church, really. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that's it, yeah. Coming. You know, and then you've got yeah. total agreement, that's right? That's it, yeah. And, um, but those seeds that were sown then, you know, 20 years later, you know, have come into my life. And I realised uh, early on my walk in terms of uh, finding the Lord that, you can definitely, without doubt, uh, live church every day. And, uh, and I, I thought that when I first became a Christian that I'd have to give up football. You know, that was my thought. It was like, well, you know, you yeah, I had to make a choice on, you know, it's either church or football. And, and uh, someone said to me, Lynn, that's where God's placed you. You know, you, you're there, you know, you're living um, God's word. You're, you're what you do, the witness that you are to the, all your um, colleagues and the fans is going to speak more than uh, than anything else. So, so for me, that was the, the first point. But now, you know, every day, you know, there's a, there's some sort of scripture that I, I hold on to because, you know, uh, the world out there, you can take so many, you know, make so many mistakes, not mm -hmm. through choice, but just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I always ask, you know, the law for protection, um, and I ask that for my family as well. And not because I'm fearful that if I don't say it, you know, something's going to happen, but I know, you know, the Bible is a living word. And, mm -hmm. and uh, like John said, uh, you know, for his story, that, you know, with the, that act of, um, you know, the running shoes to run out and get you, that, for you, that spoke to you straight away about God running to you, and that's yeah. the word coming alive, and, and that's what I've realised, the word mm. is alive, and, um, and when you start to apply it into difficult situations and you see the outcome at the end, you know, you realise then that to get some sort of scripture, some sort of word in your life, um, you know, it makes a big, big difference. But don't you think the word only becomes re relevant to you when you when something applies to it yeah you know when it mm. does come alive definitely because otherwise as i said you you are blinded sometimes mm. yeah. by some of the scriptures mm. yeah. well you can read scriptures can't you umpteen yeah, times yeah. And, mm. and it's only when the holy spirit then oh, breathes that revelation that's the one <laughs> that, yeah. whoa i've never read yeah. that before yeah. but you have yeah. actually yeah, yeah. It's, um, and maybe a little bit just develop a little bit. You talked about being made to go to church. Mm. Tell us a little bit about your early life and, yeah. and what it was like. And what, if there was any spiritual mm. or religious input in those early days? There was definitely big uh, religious input. Um, my mum and dad are from the West Indies, so they had, uh, you know, quite a religious uh, upbringing. Uh, and they just knew that that transformed, I, th I suppose, because of their childhood, yeah. going to church, you know, every Sunday and going through you know, what I'd call the ceremony, yeah. um, you know, they felt that that's what the, you know, the children needed. But for me, because I was the only one going to church, because my brother was a lot older than me, I was like, this oh, isn't fair. Bad. Yeah, this isn't fair. <laughs> why, am I going, yeah, why am I being dragged out? Um, and then, you know, I went to a Church of England church just down the road from me, because uh, I grew up in Stratford. East London, so to go to church was, um, you know, be a big thing because all your friends would be going, oh, "What are you going to church for? Yeah, what's that about?" Um, so, but by the time I was twelve and I had the opportunity to play football on a Sunday, you know, I think football was always going to be the winner. Yeah. Uh, and to be fair to my parents, they said, um, "Linvo, if you want to do that, you can do that." Um, Thank God you were good. Yeah, well, <laughs> well I went at that time, believe me. I didn't even know the offside rule, not that I know it now. But, um, I'm afraid to be good. Yeah. I'm not going to church again. <laughs> so, um, so at 12, so decided awesome. church, yeah. that was enough for me with church. And it was just that it wasn't relevant. You know, I couldn't understand uh, the things that were being said, um, how that applied to my life. As a 12-year-old, you know, you're thinking, well, what am I missing on TV? You know, yeah, or what, right. what my friends doing? So Remember what we were saying earlier, when you wait for the bit when you know it's coming to the end, mm. it's nearly done now. For you, Mandy, uh, as you brought up the Roman Catholic, yeah. um, lots of tradition there. Yeah. Um, but, of course, in your teenage years, you were going to go right away from that. Yeah. Was there any reality that stayed with you, or, or had it just been, oh, I've got to go, and nothing, as it were, really became real to you? I think... God, no matter what, he's always been in my life. And I think no matter 
how far away people saw that I went. There was always, it was always there within me. God was always there, but I just didn't go to church. And I think, like you said, I didn't understand the word and I didn't understand the meaning. I just thought God is with me. It was selfish. Mm -hmm. I knew he was there, but I didn't do any work for it and I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. So I think it was only later on in life okay, where, later. yeah, and I understood. But so I never fully went away. I didn't completely abandon it. Yes. And I would sort of occasionally go to church if I passed one, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't a mission. Yes. No. In terms of what, what was early life like for you? Was there an input which, when you got into the depths, as we've talked about already, that was going to come back? Or, or was that something new and fresh that hadn't really been in your life up until then? No, it wasn't new and fresh because... Um, like Linroy, I'd been, uh, you know, and like Mandy, I'd been taken off to church, probably rather reluctantly as a <laughs> schoolboy. Uh, but, uh, and really later on in life, I was at best a sort of Sunday Christian, a mm -hmm. half Christian, which I now know is about as much good as being half pregnant. <laughs> yeah. but at, at the time, it seemed okay. But um, it's amazing, you know, how seeds are planted. Um, when probably you, at the time, don't think anything much is yeah. happening. But one of the things I did as a child was to, I was a choir boy, so I sang, for example, the Psalms. Uh, and I didn't think they, well, I began to understand really what they yeah. meant or what they were saying. But, you've remembered but them. They, nevertheless, they stuck there. Mm. And then later in life, I mean, I've now written a book about the Psalms. Mm. I think the Psalms are extraordinarily... Uh, wonderful sort of voices of spiritual experience and so somehow or there is a connection God made connection between what you perhaps take in reluctantly in your youth and then it is revealed to you what it all means later on in life and that connection has suddenly been made mm. you know, in my life mm. maybe we could develop your story then a, a little bit to to that time where there you were in, <clears throat> in, in, in prison and, and God really became real. You, can you talk us through those days, months, weeks, whatever it was, where, where God really changed your life? Well, basically, I was going through a very well-publicized drama, which I sometimes summarize by the words, defeat, disgrace, divorce, bankruptcy, and jail. Pretty good royal flash of crises. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think I would have been insensitive if when going through uh, such a dramatic fall, I hadn't paused and said, well, where did I really go wrong? Where did I lose my spiritual and moral anchors? So I guess I was receptive to it. Um, and, and, to, and I did uh, seek God uh, in, in that very painful process. And I think that chapter that... Uh, Linroy quoted from Jeremiah 29 says somewhere, goes on to say, you will seek me with all your heart, you will seek me if you, if you search seek for me with all your heart, you will find me. And I think that's really what happened. I mean, talk about the improbable people who came alongside me, including sort of armed robbers <laughs> who had a faith or um, people who suddenly had time for me and I never had time for them. And it was, so it was a uh, not an easy journey. <clears throat> Some people talk about their conversion experience. Uh, with me, it was much more a rather painful process of stumbling, falling, sinning, backsliding, doubting, wondering if I was going slightly mad. <clears throat> and I may say, somehow it got in the newspapers, as everything about me it seemed to at that time. <laughs> and it said somehow he's found God in prison. And the bucket <laughs> falls of cynicism. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I it. I wasn't doing anything except <laughs> quietly saying a, a prayer or two and reading the Bible, but it, it sort of became you know, a target for great mockery. Uh, I hope the best part of 15 years later, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I not, it, not bothered by it. but uh, And I hope the, they've seen that they were wrong. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> <they're> <laughs> all, all were any of the inmates supportive? Did, oh, did any of them Very much so. I mean, you know, Prison is a place where people do, uh, you know, evaluate Time. where they've gone wrong. Yeah. And the church-going statistics in prison are roughly double the yeah. uh, church-going statistics in um, ordinary civilian life. 
and within that, there are people who are seeking and um, yeah. genuinely penitent. Mm -hmm. There are prodigal yeah. sons. Uh, some of them, of course, don't stay yes. re mm -hmm. repentant or. Uh, but the seeds have but, been But nevertheless, the, um, <laughs> things happen. And, and I had, I mean, a wonderful prayer partner, uh, an Irish burglar, unsurprisingly, called Paddy. <laughs> 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 he, um, and so all these people I've uh, never have thought of. I mean, you know, I was brought up as on the church reticent wing of Anglicanism. And we didn't do things like pray out loud. You know? <laughs> so finding myself doing this in a prison cell with a whole lot of villains, uh, including mm. myself. I mean, it was quite an experience, but um, a good experience. It, I mean, that's very... I mean, God must have a sense of humour somewhere. But, yeah. but, but also, I, I think what seems to me is that sometimes God has to take us out of that place where we're comfortable yeah. and where we can cope um, into a place where we can't. And then suddenly we, we begin to think about him a bit more and, as you say, begin to seek him and, and find this fact that, yeah, he, he'll be found if I seek him. Yes, I think history teaches us, not least uh, Jesus Christ's own history, that at some stage a breaking experience um, uh, there will be no equivalent of the crucifixion, but <laughs> there are experiences in people's lives, bereavement, uh, broken relationships, um, all kinds of things which happen, which uh, suddenly bring you um, much, much closer to God. I, I mean, Luther, I think, once said, it is in our pain and in our brokenness that we come closest to Christ. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is, is very mm. true. It's harder. You start to think when you're being successful, whether it's mm. in the cabinet or in the yeah. chairman yeah. of bank, yes. you think you've done it all yourself. Yes. You think that you're doing the work, walking on the water, and, <coughs> and you believe away. you have self-belief. Mm. But on life's journey, one moves out of comfort zones and learns yes. different. You know, when, when researching your, your life for this program, I, the, the, those verses in Philippians really came to mind, where Paul says, I've learnt both to abase and to abound. And that, that seems to have been what, what's happened to you. And, and, and yet God has brought you through all of that. And you have proved him in, in those situations. Well, please don't treat me as some sort of saint. No, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the, it was the, first, it was the first. But <laughs> no, no, I, think, I think what is really interesting about spiritual journeys, generally mine in particular, is not how good we become, but how much we try and change. Yeah. Uh, and um, if we're, as long as we're still trying to change, I think we're probably on the right road. Amen. Amen. Mandy, uh, let's talk about your change. Um, and obviously, you um, t take us sort of from the early teens getting involved with, uh, with Bill and, and eventually getting married. And... and where that led to, where, when did God start breaking yeah. in to bring you back to him? I think going back to what you said before as well, God does fit the back for the burden. Mm. And at the time, you, you can't imagine why you were given it. But I think then when you get taken through that journey, you can see why you have to be broken down. One, like you said, to be brought closer to him. But two, to have those experiences of what you've been through, um, whether it was in your career... Um, just so then, you know, you can, you can teach other people mm. and project to them, you know, what you've done and, and, and where you're at and what the meaning is. Um, I suppose in my life things did happen very, very early. Um, so now that, that's why, you know, I have a bit of an, an infinity with young people and, and, you know, those teenage years, especially now with the sexualization of young children. I can see right back to where it sort of happened and, and where it's going. Um, so through, through my years, I did grow up very quickly, you know, coming sort of from a broken home. Um, my mum wasn't very well at all and lived with my mum and my sister. Um, and, and I think when Bill came along, it was very much of, it was almost like having a, another world to step into and of someone to sort of, sort of to look after me really. I think in that way, and obviously from the paper's view, it, it's, it's seen completely differently, and, and that's fine, and I think, you know, God has taught me to deal with that in a different way, yes. and people needed to know about that. Um, and I think 
and then just seeing the world from the other side in the world of rock stars, pop stars and TV actors and clubs and nightlife and everything. It, it, it's not pretty, but at the same time, they're no different from you or I or from, you know, from the person we're born as. We are all the same. Um, and then I had my experiences of the modelling world and the music business. Um, I was quite protected throughout. I think God gave me good families within those units, so I was lucky because I think things could have got bad. Um, my health became quite bad from quite a young age, mm -hmm. but it really stopped me from going down certain routes. I never took drugs, and people say, don't be silly. You mix with the Rolling Stones. You, should, you must have taken drugs. <laughs> but I think, for me, I never felt well a lot of the time, so I was always... I wouldn't take that because I feel ill already. I don't want to take that and feel worse, or I don't know how it's going to react. So I was quite a sensitive character. So I had lots of protection going on, and I didn't even know about it, where it was coming from. But obviously I had to experience all these things, all these different things, different people, different lifestyles. And then it came to a point where I was grounded to a halt. I couldn't move. I was stuck in the house. I was ill. Um, and I was just stuck there until... That day, I did used to pray and say, you know, what are you doing? Come on, hurry up, I want to get back out there. <laughs> and it was like, you're not going back out there for that. And I used to fight it. And I think for years, you know, I almost kept myself prisoner mm. because I did fight it, because I was still young. You know, I was 19, 20, 21. I was thinking, I want to get back out there and live. But it wasn't meant to be. Mm. So I think it was when I gave into it mm. and when I just went with the flow and thought, right, I've just got to be who I am was then when my life started to change. It was still a long haul of about 10 years of, I still used to say, God, you know, when am I going to sort of get better back to what I want? But it was almost like, no, because if I let you go back now, you're just going to go back there. Mm. So it was a real lesson and something I never went back to. And it's very interesting, isn't it, that what it indicates is that God does yeah. watch over us even before yeah. we come to him. I, I, I think it's amazing yeah. when you he hear stories. He knows everything about you. I know. <laughs> everything. No <laughs> hiding. Because you, you, you could have become another tragic statistic if yeah. you'd have gone down the drug yeah. route. Or Absolutely. And so God knows what he's doing, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, Linvoy, uh, I, I think it's, it's written out, you've touched upon it already with football. Football was your God. Yep. Um, now, you can't have two gods in your life. Uh, um, how, you know, how did it come about that, that you could put the football down and say, you are my God? Yeah, it was, um, I think, even after I became a Christian, so I was 29, 30, um, I still played with a lot of fear. You know, I didn't want to let anybody down, um, you know, even, it didn't matter how well I played, it'd be, I'd hear one voice of criticism um, above, all the, yeah, above all the plaudits. Um, and then it was when uh, the manager at the time, Harry Redknapp, uh, he came and you know, uh, had a little chat with me and said, Linvoy, look, we don't think you've got a future at the club. So, um, so I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, I was like, okay, thanks. You know, just before a game, don't need to hear that. But, um, but I got really angry and I didn't know, you know, as a Christian, the, the model Christian in the, in the world's eyes, oh, you don't get angry, you know, yeah. you, you don't swear, you you're know, you don't, you, yeah, person. you try to be the perfect person. But I was angry, you know, and I had all these horrible thoughts. I thought, if I see you down an alley, Harry, I'm, you know, there's all this going, you know, and um, because I, I thought it was a personal attack against me, you know, questioning how good I was. But for him, it was like, well, I need results. I can't see you being a player in my team to get results. So, unfortunately, you're going to have to go to let someone else come in. So, um, you know, I was angry for a couple of weeks. And I had good people around me, you know, in my early, early walk who are still with me now. And um, one of the guys said to me, you know, I've got a scripture for you. You know, and it's about serving God. You know, don't worry about man. Don't worry about the supporters. Don't worry about Harry. Don't worry about anybody else. But serve God with all your heart. I thought, okay then, you know, I'll try that. You know, I'll see if that fits. Yeah. So uh, the first couple of days, you know, uh, going to training, right, God, this is for you. You know, okay, God, third day, this is for you. But my attitude started to change. The anger started to go. I started to enjoy my football. And then about a month later, Harry said, 
Lynn, I think I've made a mistake. I don't want you to go now. <laughs> so I said, um, I said, in my heart, I was saying, yeah, but I'm not doing it for you, Harry. I'm doing it for God. <laughs> yeah. you know? And that was the point when I realised wow. that if I start serving God, if it's an audience of one, yeah. and I please him, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, no. I'm doing my best for God. Mm. And, and that's when I, you no know... No pressure. The, no pressure. And then I started to serve God first, and everything else fell under that, because I knew that everything underneath God will be taken care of because God is, uh, is in charge of everything. Did Harry keep you? He did. Yeah, yeah he had no choice in the end. <laughs> God was in control. God's, exactly. God's exactly. bigger even than Harry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I mean, I, I think what's interesting, because we're, we're talking about the Word of God, and mm. you talked about there, about a particular verse that mm. you were given um, being made real in your life. And, and you covered it in about 30 seconds, yep. and it all sounded so easy. <laughs> um, but... I mean, there are other people looking out there, w watching the program, looking on, saying, hang on, I I've, I've been trying to work this verse mm. out for years. I've yeah. been, I, I mean, it, was it that easy or what was going through your life at that time? Well, there was a lot of stuff. When, when I say stuff, the stuff was, you know, family life. Uh, my wife wasn't well. Um, you know, I had two young children at the time and was concerned that her health was affecting them and affecting the family home. So I had all this playing in the background. Um, and I had a choice to make, and I think that's what it comes down to, the choices we make. And I had a choice to make. I can either be angry, be angry at the world, because, you know, Linvoy, you know, is, is good, because in my head I'm good. Yes. You know, the world might not see that, but in my head I'm good. Um, and I had a choice to go into training every day and say, right, Lynn, this is for God. And even though it didn't happen overnight, yeah. it gradually happened and my attitude continued to change. And that was what I knew, noticed, that because I didn't have this anger and this, you know, I'm against him because he, what he's done to me. You can it, enjoy every can, day. Yeah, you enjoy every day. And that gradual change. And, and then when I started to apply that into other areas of my life, because, you know, we was in a lot of debt at the time, trying to chase the dream, mm -hmm. trying to live like everybody else yeah. lives, you know. And, we saw that turn around as well because there was another scripture about finances and things like that. And after two years, I looked back and I thought, wow, where, where did that moment happen? When yeah. did that point happen? Mm -hmm. And it was something that John mentioned early on and Mandy as well mentioned early on that everything that was given to us at an early age, the seeds uh, from the Bible, God allowed us to, it was in our heart. It never grew in any way. We all went off and done our own thing you know, try to be the best at what we, you know, what we felt we were, you know, the path we was going down. And at, an, at one, some point, God said, right, I need you now, you know, and I'm calling you, you know, can you hear me? Okay, then I'll take that away. You know, I, wanna, I want my voice to be louder in your life. <clears throat> and at that point, you start to realise that when did God start talking? Was it when, you know, I got injured? Yes. Mm -hmm. Was it when I came back from injury? He was still talking to me, but football became big in my life again was it when my wife became sick because now it's out of control you know we no one can do anything about this uh, and that was the point I heard him at his loudest because mm. that's when I realized no matter how much football I play yeah. no matter what crowd I play in front of you know whatever player I'm up against more importantly you know my wife's at home not well and I can't yeah. do anything yeah. and that's when I heard him at his loudest it's, it's very I mean You've all come, as we said at the beginning, from such different backgrounds and had such different experiences. But the Lord and his word have worked in your lives. And I think it's so encouraging. And, you know, people may be looking on saying, well, I'm not famous, you know, and, mm. you, know, and I, I'm, you know, I was never this. But the reality is the same, isn't yeah. it? Because yeah. he's the same Lord. Yeah. Um, of whoever you are and, and the principles that we're sharing about here mm -hmm. and you've worked out are, 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 are for them as well. Yeah. Um, uh, Jonathan, I suppose one of the things I'd like to do at this point, because you've all been in different realms, um, is, is to really ask about, obviously, politics was your realm. Um, how easy do you think it is for Christians to be wholeheartedly involved in, in, in politics today? Is it, is it something which can happen or is it something you feel God's got to really equip you and call you for? Well, politicians as a sort of class 
uh, on the whole, have a rather bad press, <laughs> like journalists. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I was both, so I yeah. can say that. You're, uh, you're double strike. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think um, at the end of the day, these are all individual yes. journeys. And um, politics at its best is a very fine form of public service. And whatever you think of politicians collectively, most people, when they start to talk about individual members of parliament they've known, have served their constituencies as well, um, and there are plenty of good, believing, Bible-reading folk in the House of Commons and House of Lords, they tend to have a rather better view. So I'm not sure we should go around worrying too much about uh, the world's view. We should worry about God's view. Mm-hmm. And our journeys... Uh, are really at their best, and goodness, what a fine example Linroy has just told us about. But at their best, they are a, a journey from self centeredness, which well, most of us become, begin, <coughs> to God centeredness. And no one except one person makes that walk perfectly. But as we go along, it may be, if we are reading the word, if we're praying, maybe we become better at the journey and get further along. Uh, the road to God-centeredness. We'll never completely arrive there, but politicians, um, footballers, uh, models, <laughs> wives of pop singers, they're no different, really. I, I think people's views are important as well as God. I know God is the ultimate mm. view, but I think people's views are important because maybe we are the role models out there, um, and, you know, we can help. He speaks, he uses us, you know, as the instrument to speak his word. Mm. Um, and I think it's important that to show people, no matter what job that you do, we're all very different, mm. that we are, as I said before, we are just human. And at the same time, to be Christian or Catholic, um, we are still us. We can still have our humour. We can still go out and have fun. You can still have a drink or if people want to smoke. You know, people can still get on with their lives and be the same person that you were born and the gifts you were given. You don't have to change uh, and become radically different. Um, you know, not, it's like not everyone has to be, you know, like Cliff Richard. <laughs> Sorry, Cliff, I love Sir Cliff. <laughs> no, but, you know, people, that's what they think. If, you know, in the music business, if you then turn to God, you become Cliff Richard or um, the same you know, in football. You know, there's a role model there that, you know, everyone thinks you're that certain person. Yeah. It's an interesting thought. I mean, maybe you don't see yourself as that, Jonathan, but do you realise that, yeah, people were looking at you, as you say, you, you had a terrible press and, I, I mean, we can all remember some of those mm-hmm. headlines and, you know, and, 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 and yet here was you as an individual that were going through a life-changing experience and people were looking on, sneering and, 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 and all the rest of it. As you came out of that and, and over the years you've continued to walk with the Lord, do, do you sense that people are still looking at you today and saying, well, it did work? I don't think of myself as a role model, but I guess the last part of your question is true. Um, I do become conscious as I go on. For example, I get a lot of letters from people in trouble of one kind or another. And sometimes these letters say, well, if you could get through your troubles, you know, <laughs> tell me how to get through mine. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the, the gist of it. And... Um, my sort of, if you like, constituency of people in trouble with the law or on their way to jail, suddenly it started to include MPs, uh, all of whom I've been mm-hmm. writing to, and now it's suddenly <laughs> likely to include distinguished journalists. Yeah, yeah. And, so <laughs> and so, I mean, and, and really the message is, you know, God's grace can reach out to anyone yeah, and lift yeah. anyone up, yeah. uh, and it really, even though there may be earthly punishments uh, involved, um, they can change. They can Mm. accept the grace of God. Mm. And um, I wrote a book about John Newton, the slave ship captain who became uh, one of the great Christians and wrote Amazing Grace. And we don't know when wretches like us are going to get saved, but it... it, He's still doing it. He's He's still still doing doing it. I see you as a role model, because you said something earlier on that is close to my heart about 
being the best people we can be, you know, and every day just humbling yourself and as every day goes on, that's exactly how I think. Mm. As my life goes on, I just want to be the best person I can possibly be to the day I die. Yes. And, and then that is showing people around you that you want to be a better mm. person. But I guess the only way we can do that is, is really what Limbo was saying, mm. is, is allowing God to be God yeah. in our lives. Because we can't change ourselves. We no. can desire to change, yeah. we can seek God to change, but in the end, uh, and both Jonathan and Limbo have mentioned, yeah. uh, circumstances, they could not change, no. but he could. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Limbo, when you stepped out on, on, on the pitch uh, after your conversion, did, did you have a sense that, hey, I'm, I'm a role model, and, and when you got these <coughs> red cars that we were talking about <laughs> earlier on? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, you see, I always ask questions yeah, before I have that I bring sure. in. <laughs> but but did, did, did you have a sense that you'd done something wrong, you'd let people down? Mm. What, what was going on inside of you? Um, early on, I'd say, uh, I always thought to myself, well, I just want to do my best. Um, and there was the, the two times that I got sent off, um, the, the first time was, it was one of those it, two incidents where you think to yourself, well, you, you, on another day, when I, you know, you would have got one yellow card and that would have been it. I got two yellow cards and, um, you know, we lost the game. But the second one, um, now, my walk had, had really changed because, um, you know, I had friends who I was praying with before the game and you know, I was on the phone. Uh, lads thought I was taking bets before the game, but I was on the phone having a, a bit of prayer. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember the game, we, we, we were winning 3-1. You know, one of the guys had got a hat-trick. I'd scored. Sorry, no, he got the hat-trick after I got sent off, but I scored in that game. And it was one of those games where you just thought, well, everything's going so well. And then the ref um, gave me a red card for allegedly throwing a punch. Now, the angle that I was supposed to have thrown his punch at, it would have meant I'd have to, you know, reach behind me and, you know, it's like a cartoon scene, really, <laughs> yeah. to do something, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, he definitely missed what had happened. Um, and I remember walking off the pitch, I was angry, and I didn't, I didn't care what anyone else thought, and I never thought I'd let anyone down or anything like that. I just thought, this is wrong. Then I got a text two hours later from a friend just saying, you know, Jesus was innocent too. And it just made me think, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> you know, can you put that perspective on it? Um, yeah, so, so then straight away after that, I just thought, no, that's fine. But you do realise, a few years on, I, I started to realise that, you know, I was becoming a role model, um, more for what the charity was doing, yeah. but also for other players, because other players were saying, Linvoy's a Christian, isn't he? And I was, you know, not to me personally, but... You know, I wonder how he's going to react in this situation. I wonder who's going to react in that situation. And I realise that, you know, I've got to live this now. Yeah. You know, I can't put this on, you know, when I go to church on a Sunday or when I'm with my Christian friends. I've got to put yeah. this on every single yes. day. And, and I recognise, again, and I mentioned it earlier, about being a witness, that no matter what the circumstance is, you know, I've just got to represent God in the right way. And believe me, I've fallen down so many times, yeah. you know. I've got into so many scrapes. Yeah. But... It was a case of, you know, that reaction. It's like, no. And as long as I, I've always realised, as long as I learn from, learn from it, it. You don't know, do it again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And try not to. And God's there, like yeah. my, you know, yeah, my that's verse. It. Yeah. He's there, opened up. Mandy, the, the, the modelling world and, and, and the singing world, um, it doesn't always sound conducive to, uh, mm. to living a Christian life. How tough? Do you mean how tough was it? To be a Christian in, in those realms. <sighs> I think it's difficult because it can be rock and roll at times, but at the same time it is work as well. I think people on the outside, when they see you know, their favourite artists out there singing, they think, oh, look, it's a great life. But really it is just working and travelling and, and sell it, selling, selling yourself. Um, but I think to be there and then to just say, oh, yeah, I'm just popping off to church or to try and have conversations with people with about God, you just don't do it mm -hmm. unless God puts you in the path of someone that shares the same and it just happens, as you know it does, yeah. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, you just have those conversations. But otherwise, no, it, it's not there. Right. Yeah. Now, all, all three of you are living uh, your Christian life in the sense of wanting to see things change. And I'd just like to, to talk about this. I mean, Jonathan, I think you're fairly wanting to get involved in prison reform and, and, and areas like that. Tell us a little bit about that, and, and what do you think needs to change? Well, I am involved in 
prison reform, uh, and it's what you call a slow job. But I think the biggest thing in prison reform is that, uh, yes, we believe in locking some people up, and I think that is right in some circumstances. Yes, uh, you know, we believe in protecting the public from dangerous people. Our Victorian ancestors believed in a third sort of leg of the tripod of criminal justice, which was rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And they were much sort of keener on it than we are in a curious way because we've let sort of great bureaucracies sort of take over rehabilitation. And on the whole, they're not doing it very well because seven out of every ten prisoners go back to jail. Mm -hmm. So, and, I, and also I feel rehabilitation is God's work. I mean, you know, that's what... That's what you're into. Yeah. <laughs> Forget about me, but I mean, just look at the number of stories of people in the gospel who yes, were amen. turned yeah. around yeah. and sort of living again, living again in Christ. That's what it means as its Christian verse. So I think that there's a great opportunity for how we sort of do post-release mentoring, rehabilitation, all kinds of very practical things you can do, sort of teach the illiterate to read uh, so they can go out and you know, get jobs which they can't at the moment if they can't read Confidence labels on a white house, yeah. uh, labels on a, in a warehouse but um, I, I, I feel that prison reform uh, is a godly cause it's not the only cause I'm involved in but it's a very very yes. big one in, in, in my life so do, you, do you have hopes that you're going to make ways, or not just you, but in all that you're involved in, it, it's going to have an effect. Because we do hear, you know, prison overcrowded, you know, and, and then all sorts of ways of giving short sentences and, and don't do that. Do you, do you think there is a care for reforming and helping prisoners to change? Oh, definitely there is a care. It's a care by a minority at present. But um, what great cause hasn't started with a, only a minority of people being interested in it? And um, you say, well, do we make progress all the time? I mean, it just happens this week is going through Parliament what is in effect a major reform of something called the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, which is a cause very dear to my heart. And the legislative changes are very, very important without going into great detail mm -hmm. on the something I and other groups have been campaigning for for some time. So changes are taking place and there's a greater recognition of what needs to be done. Take literacy in prisons, or illiteracy, uh, much more effort and voluntary organizations all being devoted to that. So are changes happening? Yes, not quite at the speed that a keen reformer would like, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot happening, and, and I'm very pleased right. it is happening. And we should be praying more, I think, into that. And, yeah. and it, I mean, the scripture tells us, again, when we talk about God's word, it tells us to pray for prisoners, yes. and, yeah. uh, doesn't it? And I think it's, it is a category that, that yeah. God really does encourage us yeah, to, to be involved with. verse in Hebrews which says, remember your fellow prisoners as if you were in, in prison, prison, which a great many people have difficulty imagining, <laughs> including <You>, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a godly cause, it's yeah. a Christ-centred well, cause. Of God go on. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Really? <laughs> uh, Mandy, you're, you're involved, uh, especially, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier on. T tell us about some of the things that, because probably, again, each one of you, because it's yeah. coming out of where you've been and what you've done, yeah. that, uh, that you're involved in, in, in these days. Um, I work with a, a few places, but one close to my heart is um, Home Start. And it's a volunteer role where they match you with certain families. Um, and really, you just, you're just there to work alongside them, to help them gain their confidence and esteem. Some people might just have young children. You know, they might not be too well or tough times or work problems. It can be anything. But I just think, you know, if you're there to help, just to be a listening ear sometimes. Um, and it can just help them on their way a little bit. So that's one of the things I like doing. Um, also, I work with a charity back in Manchester um, called The Five Stars, and um, we raise money for cancer at the big hospital in Manchester. Mm, yeah. But, you know, most things I do are for the better for other people. 
and just to help give and, causes. And I, I think you, you were concerned, especially with, with young people yeah. as, as well, especially with the whole um, sexualisation yeah. that's put upon them at, yeah. at an early age. Is this something that you're very concerned about? I think about? so. I think, I mean, it's quite big at the moment, but I think maybe that's the press, you know, they're catching on to it and making a big deal out of it. But I think it's something that needs looking at, mm. because I think years ago, I mean, at the time when I was around and in the papers, and in, especially in the music business, I actually wasn't allowed on certain TV stations because my name was connected with something of a sexual nature. Mm -hmm. um, so now, I mean, forget that. You yeah. know, if, if, if sex sells something now, get it in there. And, and that's crossed the board of, you know, high glossy magazines to all kinds of magazines, to TV, clothes, shops, it's everywhere. So I think we've just got to go back a few steps mm. because I think children are under pressure to, to grow up. Um, and then I just think they're not, they're not really seeing and feeling what life is about. You know, we've moved away from family life so much and children are just taking on this new world and not thinking about jobs for themselves for the future. It's either about being famous mm. um, and not really realising what it's like to just grow up as you know, happy young person. And with all the peer pressure, it's, yeah. it's di we've got to get that message out. And I guess people yeah. like you that have been there, yeah. maybe they can relate to that a little more than yeah. to other people that have had yeah. nothing to do with it telling yeah. them. I've mentored a few young people in schools. And, you know, everyone has their problems, no matter what age or how big or small their problems are. Um, but a lot of them, it is that peer pressure growing up, and especially with the girls, you know, wanting to look a certain way, thinking if they look a certain way, they will get a certain job and they will learn this amount of money to obtain this goal and that goal. And really, it's about... It's trying to tell them that that's not what it's all about, but trying to tell them and, you know, getting them to believe it is, is quite a tough job. Yeah. Um, but then I think if I tell them a little bit about my testimony, then it makes them think, oh, OK, well, you're still happy and, and having a nice life, and, but you don't need all the excesses that come with it. Um, yeah, OK, that sounds good. Yeah. So, so plants that seed. Great, yeah. great. And, Linvoy, we mentioned at the beginning you're involved with this uh, faith and football. Uh, yeah. tell, tell us a bit about it and what you're doing and, and how you want to affect young people's lives. Yeah, well... Um you know, the, the idea really came about through just giving something back. Uh, the, you know, I was, only, uh, I was only saved a year when the idea came up about starting a charity. And um, it was with uh, two former Pompey players, one a guy called Mick Mellows and Darren Moore, who is still playing. I don't know how he's still playing. He won't, <laughs> he won't like me saying that, but he's still, he's still going on. You know, we're um, all going to mark him out this season, No, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no um, but we just knew we wanted to give something back uh, to the community. Um, so we thought we'd start little football leagues. But our, the thing for me, which I didn't really understand, and it's only starting to fall into, into my heart now, was that uh, most of the time when I was growing up, church would be, you know, come, come over here, come inside, come and look inside. And uh, when we started uh, Faith and Football, we said, right, we want to get the church to go outside, you know, and get into people's lives. Yeah. And we knew football was going to be the vehicle. You know, football watched throughout the world. You can go anywhere in the world now, and most kids will know a Premier League team. You know, it's that big. So we said, right, we'll, we'll give children the opportunity to play football in a nice controlled area, um, whether you can play football or not, it doesn't matter. You're going to be in an environment where you're encouraged. Um, you know, we're going to look after you. You're not, you're not going to pay for anything. Uh, and that's how it started. Um, eight years on, um, you know, we've got nine leagues in Portsmouth. We've wow. got, I think it's uh, five in Birmingham and three in Plymouth. Brilliant. And it's the same thing. We just want to give these children the opportunity to to express themselves, but in a safe environment. But more importantly, getting the churches involved you know, so people can see that the church isn't about the building. It's about, you know, individual people loving. Yeah. Exactly. And it's about loving. It's <laughs> yeah. about loving your neighbour. Yeah. And uh, through that, we've uh, started literacy schemes, uh, something called Extra Time Reading, where we've heard exactly the same thing, the same stats Brilliant. that children going from junior school into uh, senior school, 11 years old, got reading ages of six years old. Wow. So these are the kids you find that are kicking off you know, yeah. being disruptive. Especially and boys, mm. social yeah. and talking. Mm. That's a good way to get them talking, Exactly, isn't it? yeah. We've we just got a few minutes left. Mm. I'd just like to ask each one of you, really, um, within your sphere, within your sphere there, Linvoy, 
What would you want to say to young people, especially that may be football mad, mm. what, what would you want to say to them? I'd just say, you know, that, you know, the key thing is just give life a go. You know, really give, give your all. You know, if it's football, if it's music, if, you know, really look to, you know, give it the best shot because you never know who's watching, you never know who can uh, be there to encourage. But once you feel you've made the grade, give that gift to somebody else. You know, don't keep it for yourself. You know, whether it's your time, whether it's finances, whether it's the talent that you've got, give that gift to somebody else because you will change their lives. And that's, you know, that's what I, you know, my life is about, is being involved in changing people's Amen. lives. Amen. Because God's changed yours. Amen to that. Yes, yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Mandy, what, what would you like to say, I suppose, especially to young yeah. girls growing up in this world? I think for me, mine is probably God made you who you are. Accept it, love it, learn to love it, and, and go with it, whatever, whatever life brings you. Um, but I think like what I said earlier is um, just try and be the best person you can be every day, and then the next day try and be the better person, and the day after, mm -hmm. to be a better one. Mm -hmm. To be the best person you can be. Right, and, uh, and, and see that God can, can only do that. We, yeah. we, we, we need to want to do it, yeah. But he alone can actually make those changes in their lives. Um, I don't know which group we should get you to speak to, John. <laughs> the journalists or the, or the reformers or the politicians or the prisoners. I, I don't know. But what, what would you like to say in, in, in a sort of a final minute or so? Well, I would say be still and know that I am God, which is another great line from the Psalms. But the reason I offer it as a piece of advice, particularly the groups we've just been talking about, but almost anybody, is that we live in an ever busy, ever rushed world. Yes. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> to just settle down and be still and think about life's spiritual dimension and Amen. seek and you will find God. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. We've been talking today about this book, the most famous book in the world. It's published uh, by Roper Pemberthy. You can get it from local bookshops. You can obtain it from Amazon. Really great. You can read uh, what the guys here with me today have been saying. You can read uh, a, a, what lots of other people are saying as well. Uh, Jonathan, Mandy, Linvoy, thank you so much for being with us today. Really do appreciate it. Trust you've enjoyed being with us. See you again very soon. Bye for now.